Upon release, Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare was an instant classic and bestseller, even outselling the highly anticipated Halo 3 in the fall of 2007. So while sister developer Treyarch worked on the COD game for 2008, Infinity Ward was able to focus on their next game for 2009. Taking what they had learned from Modern Warfare, the next entry in the series was bigger in every way. The multiplayer was added on and expanded, becoming the template for most Call of Duty multiplayer suites today, and a new third mode was added based on the concept of the Mile High Club bonus mission. But while Spec Ops and multiplayer were big draws for players, this was probably one of the few times in the series history where almost everyone you talked to also played the single player campaign. Featuring new characters, a deeper story, and shocking twists that remain on everyone's top 10 shocking gaming moments list, Modern Warfare 2 campaign and the game in general was built on the mantra that bigger is better. While the impact this game has had can't be denied, many considered this to be the turning point for Call of Duty as a franchise, where substance took a backseat to spectacle. While I agree Modern Warfare 2 is perhaps one of the biggest and grandiose games in the series, I think it manages to balance itself very well, managing to add substance to the spectacle. I've talked about this game before when the campaign remaster came out in 2020, but this time I'm going to be going much more in depth than before to really get into the minutia and not just the spectacle. So strap yourselves in, because we're about to go on quite the ride. Modern Warfare 2 picks up five years after the end of Call of Duty 4, and it wastes no time in setting up its major thesis. While Modern Warfare had a few things to say about modern conflicts, Modern Warfare 2 is really built around making a statement about war. The phrase, history is written by the victor, is so ancient no one really knows where it originated from. Modern Warfare 2 takes that quote and uses it as a warning about how wars are fought, and why this game has more substance than most people give it credit for. We get a first-hand look at this during the intros, we see how things have changed in the five years since the original game ended. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Boundaries shift, new players step in, but power always finds a place to rest its head. We fought and bled alongside the Russians. We should have known they'd hate us for it. History is written by the victor, and here I am thinking we'd won. But you bring down one enemy and they find someone even worse to replace him. Locations change, the rationale, the objective. Yesterday's enemies are today's recruits. Train them to fight alongside you and pray they don't eventually decide to hate you for it too. The Russian government loyalists the players fought beside in Modern Warfare 1 lost their civil war and the ultranationalist bad guys won. Now the last game's villain, Imran Zakayev, is hailed as a hero in the new Russia. But thanks to the clandestine nature of the Special Forces operations and the cover-up, no one outside of his inner circle really know about his crimes and trying to turn the east coast of the US into glass. So to an everyday Russian on the street, he's a martyr who died fighting for more free Russia. It's this type of disinformation that the game uses frequently in its storytelling. We begin the story proper in Afghanistan as Private First Class Joseph Allen. The Army Rangers are training the local forces how to defend themselves against the leftover remnants of Khaled al-Assad's army from the first game, who have presumably migrated after a portion of their country is nuked. But moreover, this is a great opportunity for General Shepard to find a new recruit for a Special Forces Task Force, the 141. After Private Allen proves himself during an attack on a nearby city, he's quickly recruited and we get to meet more of the team. Soap McTavish, now a captain, is the field commander of Task Force 141 and is tasked with retrieving a downed spy satellite that fell into Russian territory. Instead of playing a soap again, however, the player takes control of Gary Roach Sanderson, because apparently everyone in the 141 needs a fancy nickname. The two sneak their way into the Russian airbase using the cover of a blizzard and retrieve the ACS module from the downed satellite. After Soap is compromised, though, an explosive Plan B allows them to escape from the Russians and head back to base. Switching back to Shepard and Allen, we get the details on our new villain, Vladimir Makarov. He is the former right-hand man to Zakayev and his son, being the fourth horseman in the group that orchestrated the Urzikstan War in 2011. But unlike Zakayev before him, Makarov is a much more fleshed-out villain, as it's clear he's bonkers and just wants to watch the world burn. Being a part of the ultranationalist camp, he should have been satisfied with his side winning the war, but instead he thinks that Russia should go further and conquer the globe. So since the end of the war, he's been carrying out terrorist attacks against his own people to make his point. Now he's got a new one planned, and Shepard is sending in Allen as an undercover operative to earn Makarov's trust so he can be taken down. And so now we've reached the controversy that sent news pundits and lawmakers into a tizzy back when this game first came out, the No Russian Mission. I spoke on this issue at length back when I reviewed the remaster of 2020, so I won't really go into it as much here. Instead, I'll just quickly recap my thoughts. While No Russian does allow you to act as a terrorist should you choose to pull the trigger, as a mission and gameplay segment, it deserves to exist and does so for more than just shock value. 
If you choose to skip the mission, as the game gives you the option to do so, the entire narrative of the game becomes disjointed as there's not even a cutscene that really properly explains the aftermath. The following cutscene acts as if you have knowledge of what happened, so someone going into the game blind then or now with no knowledge of the controversy and what no Russian entails would be left confused. The 2020 remaster didn't even add anything to alleviate this issue, further cementing the story content as integral to the plot of not just Modern Warfare 2, but the following entry as well. So the level exists as a testament to the artistic expression of the developers who worked on this game, and deserves to exist whether or not you agree with it. And more than just moving the plot forward, it really cements that Makarov is a villain not to be taken lightly like Al-Assad or Sakaev in the previous game. Their power came through the armies they had amassed. While Makarov is shown to have his followers, they are much more smaller in number, and yet with a fraction of the band power his mentor had, Makarov is able to reach out and manipulate a whole nation with a single bullet. This is a message. The Americans thought he could deceive us. When they find that body, all of Russia will cry for war. With Alan dead and the one for one on the back foot, their task now is to prove America's innocence. That means locating the man who supplied the massacre. Alexander Rojas. Another point of Infinity Ward's bigger is better mantra, Modern Warfare 2 visits several more locales than the previous game did. COD 4 mainly featured foresty Russia or the more arid environments of Middle Eastern Uzbekistan. So far in just the first act of MW2, we've been to Afghanistan, the snowy Russian mountains, and an urban airport. Now we're visiting the colorful Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, and like the previous levels, we're being presented with more variety in terms of level design than in the first game. The favela level is very enclosed and compact, with angles and choke points around practically every turn. On veteran difficulty, this single mission easily encompasses an hour of playtime, as you have to move slow and methodically to clear the section. This is in stark contrast to the very scripted No Russian, or the more open cliffhanger levels that precede it. So while the mission ends in success and Rojas is captured, the one for one is now left on their own as the American Defense Network becomes dismantled. Turns out the Russians managed to copy the ACS module SOAP and Roach fought to retrieve earlier, which let them hack into the military's defense grid. Thus begins the invasion of America, as you are put back with the Army Rangers. But with Alan dead in Moscow, who do you take control of now? Ramirez! 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 That's right, it's time to step into the shoes of Private Ramirez, the man who is asked to do everything and can deliver twofold. This is a part of the game that has strangely aged well and not well at the exact same time, as back in the day, the idea of Russia invading another country was scary, but still firmly in the realm of fiction. Nowadays, not so much. But anyway, now we come to another feature of the campaign, which is several gimmicks that get used once or twice throughout the runtime. While levels in COD 4 occasionally had you operating a turret or something, Modern Warfare 2 is constantly shaking things up and introducing new elements into the game. Most levels have a little extra going on top of the regular run and gun shooting. Cliffhanger had the snowmobile chase. Later missions have turret or stealth sections, and Wolverines has a more open-ended level design that includes the use of a Predator missile killstreak for multiplayer. While this mission has you doing a more constant stream of objectives compared to Warpig from COD 4 where you simply fought down a single street and in buildings at your leisure, the different objectives thrown at you here and the constant running back and forth from building to building keeps the variety flowing and energy high. Elements of this level, such as the Burger Town name, have become memorable in their own right, cementing them as mainstays in other Call of Duty titles. So with the invasion of America underway, the one for one now have information on how to find Makarov and bring him to justice so the war can end. The only info that Rojas was able to give our team is that the man Makarov despises the most is locked up in a Russian gulag as prisoner 627. But the intel won't do them much good if they can't get out of Brazil alive. What follows is a pretty standard linear escape mission. It's totally serviceable and would probably be a bore if it weren't for the final dash at the end, in which Roach must simply run and jump for Nikolai's payflow to reach safety. Back with the Rangers, you fight through the Russian-infested suburbs of Virginia alongside an armored LAV affectionately known as Honey Badger. Honey Badger don't care. Honey Badger don't give a shit. It just takes what it wants. This is another fun one, as the Honey Badger is almost impossible for the enemy to destroy and wipes out entire squads after being directed by your laser designator. Then the mission ends with something of an oddity that never really gets properly resolved, but I'll dig into that later. Before that, while the game jumps back and forth between perspectives a few times before this, we now get to stay up the one for one for a little bit. With Prisoner 627 in their crosshairs, the task force must clear an oil derrick of SAM sites and human shields in order to give the Navy a breaching point into Russian territory to begin the counteroffensive. Not only does the gimmick of the level feature slow-mo breaching, but the level design is unique as you progress vertically up the derrick as opposed to horizontally like in normal levels. Thermal scopes are even required as smoke screens are deployed, constantly keeping the player on their toes as to what comes next. With the hostages saved and the SAM sites cleared though, the 1 for 1 makes its way to the Gulag to extract a 627. And as it turns out, that prisoner is none other than the long-lost Captain Price, whom Soap immediately relinquishes control of the 1 for 1 to. So it begs the question though, where was Price this whole time? 
How long was he in the gulag for? There's a couple of potential answers for that. The first comes from Soap's journal, which was part of the collector's edition of Modern Warfare 3. According to it, Soap thought Price died on the bridge at the end of COD 4, as you can see a Russian soldier trying in vain to revive him. However, the version I prefer comes from the short film Find Makarov, Operation Kingfish. This was a short film endorsed by Activision after a fan crew made a short film called Find Makarov in their excitement for Modern Warfare 3. Well, everyone liked it enough that they gave them a larger budget to create a prequel to Modern Warfare 2 that told the tale of how Price was lost in the Gulag. In it, Task Force 1 for 1 is sent in to kill or capture Kingfish, the code name for their unknown target. However, the op was a trap, and the 1 for 1 and their Delta Force allies are forced to evacuate as a horde of angry Russians descend on them. Soap was wounded by an RPG blast, and Price is forced to stay behind to provide them with cover as their Osprey takes off, leading the task force to believe that he's dead. While the short isn't perfect and has a few unintentionally funny moments like the poor choice of a voice dub for Ghost, oh, I clip. and an AC-130 getting shot down by a free-fire RPG, the fact that a pretty small film crew managed to put this together is impressive. I also think it works better in canon, as Shepard and the rest of the 1 for 1 don't bat an eyelash at Price taking command of the task force back from Soap. Even if they only knew him by reputation and Soap could vouch for him, I'm not sure it would have flown otherwise. The way the dialogue is written also suggests that everyone is already familiar with Price by more than just reputation. Back from the brink, Captain. Out of the frying pan is more like it. But either way you slice it, Price is officially back in action, and he's got a plan to turn the tide of the war in the United States' favor. Officially, their goal is to stop a nuclear submarine from launching missiles, but instead, Price commandeers it and launches one purposefully. Meanwhile, as the assault on America continues, the Rangers shift their focus to defending Washington, D.C. from the Russian invaders. But that battle is all but lost, and the Rangers are instead buying time for the evacuation to complete. The remainder of the Ranger missions take place in D.C., and each one becomes a more desperate struggle than the last. Just when you think you've done well and given valuable support, you're shot down seemingly surrounded by an infinite number of enemy forces. The last we see of the Rangers is Ramirez's vision being blocked out by a helicopter spotlight, eerily similar to what happened to the Marines in the previous game. But instead of everyone dying like before, we see Price's missile crest over the edge of the planet via the viewport of an astronaut on the International Space Station. Despite his wishes, he ends up getting to see Infinity and beyond as the nuke detonates in the atmosphere and acts as an EMP that knocks out all power in DC. This stops the Russian forces in their tracks, and with the Americans on the back foot and low on materials already, this gives them a fighting chance to push back. And it's here I want to touch on one of the more underrated aspects of this game, and that's Corporal Dunn. While Modern Warfare 2 for the most part does succeed in being bigger and better than Call of Duty 4, I think one of the areas it takes a slight step back in is the characters. Returning characters like Price and Nikolai are pretty much unchanged from before, and the new ones mostly just fill in the roles of characters that died in the original. But in some cases, some roles aren't really even filled in again, as there's no quasi-comic relief character like Gaz in this game. Actor Craig Fairbass returns once more to voice Ghost, but aside from a familiar voice, Ghost doesn't really have the same smug charm to him that made everyone like Gaz so much. Ironically, I'd argue that the fact that he had the same voice as a dead character ended up launching Ghost into legendary icon status despite him not really having much by way of a unique personality. It was the familiar voice and the mystique that helped him stand out, as everyone wanted to know if he was secretly Gaz back from the dead. This even prompted a tie-in comic book to be released explaining his backstory as Simon Riley, and certainly not Gaz from Call of Duty 4. And no, they're not related either. While I love Ghost as much as the next guy, he's always been Call of Duty's Boba Fett, which is perfectly fine. The reason I point this out is that most of our protagonists are pretty much the same until you get to Corporal Dunn. The reason why I love him as a character so much is that amongst all of the hard Special Forces operators and Army veterans, Dunn is the only character that comes off as a human being. Early in the game, we hear him complaining about Shepard looking for one-for-one -one candidates and not liking how the Special Forces guys seem to act like they're better than the regular soldier. And while the Russians are literally raining from the sky, that is the only one that seems worried about the situation. Sarge, did HQ just tell us to go F ourselves? Pretty much, my brother. Then later, once the EMV goes off, done rightfully so, has a little freak out. Russians got us off now, we're falling from the sky, we're screwed, man. We're Shut totally up. hooked. Get a grip, Corporal. That's not to say he's a coward, as he proves that he's a capable soldier, but everyone has their breaking points. Amongst so many characters that could potentially be described as shallow or cliche and how unflinching they are and what's happening around them, Dunn is a refreshing character to watch as amongst an army of NPCs, he's the realest one among them. That's not to say that makes characters like Price are so bad either, but Dunn doesn't get talked about enough when this game is brought up, and I really wish that wasn't so. Most likely he gets overshadowed by Sergeant Foley, who is admittedly pretty hard to ignore since he's being voiced by Keith David. With the battle for DC a little more evened up, the Rangers make it to the White House, which has become the last bastion for the Russians. With the situation as dire as it is though, the Air Force has orders to bomb the city into oblivion if the army doesn't retake it, and show it by flying green flares on the roof. So the final fight in the White House becomes a mad dash to reach the rooftop in time before the planes arrive. 
The rush of relief that always comes once the flares are extinguished always gives me chills as the battle for DC comes to an end. So, when we going to Moscow? Not soon enough, man. But I know we're gonna burn it down when we get there. Oh, uh, when the time's right, Corporal. When the time's right. With the tide of the war turning, it's finally time to bring Makarov to justice. Price and Soap head to a potential location in Afghanistan, while Ghost and Roach head to the Georgia-Russian border. While Makarov isn't at either location, Ghost and Roach do discover a gold mine of intel and work to defend a download of the data onto a DSM. Once it's done, Ghost and Roach retreat through a horde of angry Russians as the last surviving members of the strike team. Thankfully, Shepard comes to their rescue and wards off their attackers, but not before pulling one of the most shocking twists in FPS history. Shepard's portrayal of the one-for-one one is legendary, so much that I feel like if you only knew one thing about Modern Warfare 2, it's probably that it's the one where the guy with the mustache betrays you. What helps make this so great is that the game is actually telegraphing his betrayal since the start. Early cutscenes in the game have Shepard monologuing about how history is written by the victor and how to use the tools of modern warfare. We are the most powerful military force in the history of man. Every fight is our fight. Because what happens over here matters over there. We don't get to sit one out. Learning to use the tools of modern warfare is the difference between the prospering of your people and utter destruction. We can't give you freedom, but we can give you the know-how to acquire it. And that, my friends, is worth more than a whole army base of steel. Sure, it matters who's got the biggest stick, but it matters a hell of a lot more who's swinging it. This is a time for heroes, a time for legends. History is written by the victors. After his betrayal, you kind of realize these aren't profound patriotic pontifications from a wise war hero. These are the evil machinations of a twisted snake. For those going into the game for the first time back in 2009, their expectations were effectively subverted as the real villain of the game isn't yet another Russian, but a decorated American leader. For all that people like to say that Modern Warfare 2 is the start of COD's style over substance approach, it arguably has the most to say about warfare and the blind trust we put in our leaders. The fact that Shepard was able to manipulate a war into happening to repair his own reputation after losing his forces five years earlier is a warning that holds up remarkably well in an age of disinformation on the internet and a politically charged climate. The only downside here is that the way Shepard was able to do all of this is left slightly up to interpretation in several areas. There's plenty we can assume about how things came to work out in his favor and how he knew to move certain chess pieces where, but they're never explicitly stated. For instance, how did Makarov know that Allen was an American spy? We can assume that Shepard covertly tipped him off to help engineer the war. The same goes for a lot of the intel that Shepard gives the team. The one for one is constantly sent into death-defying missions with the odds stacked against them, and while that is their job, how many of those situations were engineered by Shepard to get them killed early on? Was being left in Rio because of a communications blackout a coincidence, or were Shepard banking on them dying there? The Navy is also constantly buzzing the gulag with airstrikes when they're trying to rescue Price. So was that some Navy commander being exuberant, or was that Shepard trying to slow them down if not sabotage them completely? Hey, isn't this danger close for the task force? Come on, since when does Shepard care about danger close? Since when does Shepard care about danger close? I think a little mild speculation like this is fun, but there is one rough edge that makes all of this a tad annoying. Remember earlier there was that mission where the Rangers had to secure an HVT for Shepard, but he was dead? Well, what was the point of that? Why one of the soldiers that participated in the airport massacre is there is never explained, nor was who the target was. Ramirez retrieves a briefcase and Foley says aloud that Shepard probably won't be happy. Will he? Maybe having whoever that HVT is and one of the Russian terrorists being off the list is. One less loose end. I feel like several of these moments are breadcrumbs that were leading to a moment that never arrives. Price and Soap find Shepard's location and ransack his base before Shepard blows it up completely, but they're not there long enough to gather intel. This is probably the one downside of the game being presented in the first person's perspective, as outside of the cutscenes, any information the player takes in has to be from the perspective of a person. That means that unless the game were to do an extended flashback from Shepard's perspective, or to have him exposit it to Price or Soap, we don't get to learn the intricate details of his plan and we are left to wonder about some of the connections. Now the game doesn't need to answer every minute detail of the plan, but something to connect a few dots other than the line about losing his men five years earlier would have been nice. But all that being said, this isn't really a huge complaint as he's still an effectively built up villain throughout the game. It also makes doing this upon replays really satisfying. Hey, head on in. Time to start as soon as the first target pops. 
So if Shepard's betrayal known, Price and Soap hunt him down, ending the game with a vehicle chase in Afghanistan to book in the game. After a brief fight in which Soap is stabbed and Price is on the ropes, Soap manages to pull the knife out of himself and fling it at Shepard, hitting him square in the eye. And as we wrap up the story, I have to admire how well this remaster was done. Like Raven before them, Beanox did a wonderful job remastering this game, from refining little touches like having Soap hand roach a starting weapon from the gulag at the end of the only easy day was yesterday, to the added animations for better immersion and maybe even adding in some slightly cut content with the new opening to team player. Despite not having multiplayer spec ops attached like the COD 4 remaster did, it's awesome getting to play this game on modern hardware with advanced graphics. But all good things must come to an end. As Price rushes to patch up Soap, Nikolai arrives to whisk them away to safety. Nikolai, we've got to get Soap out of here. Duh. I know a place. And so ends one of gaming's greatest FPS campaigns. While it isn't without its shortcomings, the bigger is better thought process for Modern Warfare 2 worked to the game's credit, as it expanded on almost everything COD 4 did right. The story was more involved, the level of design and gameplay created more variety while still allowing for some player agency at times, and while the protagonist may have not been as varied as before, General Shepard and Makarov made for much more engaging villains than Zakayev and Al-Assad did before them. But while Modern Warfare 1 ended with a concrete conclusion, Modern Warfare 2 ends on a cliffhanger. Will the 1 for 1 be able to prove their innocence and clear their names? How will the war in America turn out? Will Makarov ever be brought to justice for his part in manipulating the world into going to war? While we had to wait two years for the answers, it's a good thing Infinity Ward had them, because as for what would happen next, would change everything.